Uh, it's practice here, don't fail me now. Okay. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Kyle. I'm going into fourth year now, and I'll be discussing like two parts of my research and how they encompass the idea of trying to get musicians and it applies to sound designers and other artists, but generally how to get creative people to accept artificially intelligent systems that can be used to their advantage. But it's not the kind of thing people really look at. And so as a quick prologue, I was expecting to do this talk at four and usually everyone's half asleep. So instead of doing this introduction, lit review method and so on, I put the audio at the start, so hopefully it keeps you awake, and if it doesn't, feel free to sort of zone out a little bit afterwards for the science. But yeah, and I'll be framing this with two pieces of research that I conducted. The first is a thematic analysis of interviews for 11 professional game composers, and then the second is a development of an expressive rendering algorithm that uses five transformers to predict like the expressive aspect, aspects of how a human would play a piano professionally onto non-expressive data. Oh, no, nope. it's like it seems. Yeah, we'll start with the neural net and then the audio. So in my research, before I get around to justifying this, uh, I had expectations the composers weren't really gonna like algorithms that do their job for them, but they would like algorithms that are gonna do a job that sort of sits tangentially to it and can help them to do their job better or faster. So I initially worked on a model with four transformers that anyone who was here last year will have seen. And then in the last year, we've added a fifth transformer. But an expressive rendering algorithm essentially takes professional music performances and non-expressive music data. It learns the difference and then learns to apply expressive parameters to non-expressive music. In this neural net, we take the bare minimum information of the pitch of notes on time and duration of every note in a sequence. And then we predict the expressive dynamics and micro timing adjustments to start and end of notes on note by note level. And then at a beat wise level, we predict tempo changes and use of sustain pedal. And nope, there we go. <laughs> uh, if you look to the pictures on the right, I'm going to show you a non-expressive, very robotic performance of a Haydn sonata. On this image, the lines at the bottom denote the dynamics, so you can see that all the notes have been pressed with the same sort of, uh, I would say difficulty force is probably a better word. You can also see that for all the green dots, which are notes, they line up perfectly with the metrical grid, which are the white lines. And then I'll show you an expressively rendered version if you look at the image, you can see there is a wider range of dynamics. And there's also the notes, some notes have shortened or lengthened. They've also moved sort of away from the metrical grid. So I'll just show you a quick demo. Never tried this in. Oh, I need to go to the other thing though. So that is the non-expressive version. Um, you can kind of tell from a short excerpt that every note's been hit with the same amount of force and it's just completely metronomic. And now we'll go to the expressively rendered version. Right, let's get back to full screen. I'm a Google Slides person, as you can probably tell. 
So we did perform two different listening studies for this, and I won't harp on too long about the science of it, but in the first, we had our system and another system that uses fully annotated score cues. A score cue is sheet music with annotations that sort of tell the performer how to play it expressively. Like, we expect you to get louder in this section. We expect you to suddenly get quiet, uh, slow down, speed up here, etc. Then we had a non-expressive bass line, which you just heard, and then a real human performance taken from the test split of the training data. And we found that in the first version with the four models, it performed slightly better than the baseline in expressive version. But interestingly, the more informed model performed on par, if not better than actual professional human performances, at least in 30 second excerpts. But then we decided this isn't enough and there's, it's not good science to say it's better than the inexpressive baseline. So <laughs> we created a it's kind of like a system that is similar to the industry standard so we took a thousand notes put them into logic pro used its own humanized function bounced it back out and then like, analyzed that for the distribution of how it was applying velocity and timing adjustments and then we added a second machine learning algorithm that's fully informed by score cues that someone else had made and then reconducted the experiment, including our model that has the pedal. And the pedal model did a little bit better, but we did also find that our models outperformed the industry baseline, which is a non-machine machine learning al algorithm, sorry. Uh, it outperformed the existing basis mix of machine learning algorithm and the expressive baseline. And again, virtuoso net, which is a more informed model performed on par, but slightly worse than it did previously compared to humans. So now to try and justify things, then go back to the science. <laughs> um, so artificially intelligent music technology in the promising field of great potential for creating innovation, but researchers rarely really explore the considerations or concerns of potential end users. More often than not, we make an algorithm, we evaluate it with a listener study, which 90% of the time is music undergrads because they're accessible. <laughs> Uh, we look at loss ratings where applicable, you do some metric analysis, and then it's left at the command line and no one really touches it because most research isn't commercialized anyway. But this is quite interesting because by doing that, we don't actually show musicians what AI can do. And then we don't actually learn anything about what they think about it. Like it's a very lackluster way to evaluate our own algorithmic work. And you know, video games as a medium have been long considered well suited to music generation. And we see that, like, specifically, music generation is not widely used. But if you look at PCG for generation of levels or the generation of weapons or mechanics generally, oh, sorry, one minute. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> PTG in the sense that we generate levels, weapons, mechanics, and all things outside of audio, really, is quite widely adopted both in indie and in AAA. And there was a thought here of like, I wonder why that is. But, you know, no one's really looked at that research. Uh, there's been a little bit of research where people are discussing reasons why potentially digital music generation, the music systems might not be being used, like inconsistency of output, lack of human nuance, resource intensiveness, and the need for robust timing systems. But there isn't any empirical research, which can be problematic. But if we're going to relate technology acceptance to anything, we should really look at technology acceptance as a field of literature. And there's a few different models. These are early ones. There's no old ones, but... In today's talk, I'm going to talk about the unified model of technology acceptance, which brought together eight competing models. And then it outlines four constructs, as well as some extra factors that play a significant role in determining whether technology is accepted. And this hasn't been applied to any AI music stuff, really, or a lot of game situations. But the four constructs are performance expectancy, so how well do we expect the algorithms to perform? Effort expectancy is how difficult would it be to actually integrate and use? Social influence is looking at 
sort of social factors, like if you're on Twitter all the time and the discourse is controversial, as it is with most generative AI, that plays a significant factor in people being willing to try stuff. And then the facilitating condition is like, is the use of this voluntary? Do they have experience with it? And then age and gender, etc. So kind of covered this already, but procedural content is very widely used, especially in AAA and indie for all these different things. There's three very popular games that will use this. And, you know, there are genres that are kind of creating this unending gameplay experience where you expect to spend thousands and thousands of hours. There's a really good talk uh, about Path of Exile where they designed it to be endless. But if you look at a lot of modern games, you've got four hour soundtrack. So if you're going to play a game for 3,000 hours, how long do you fall? How is the music really going to last? Even if you're hearing it interspersed, like with big gaps in the middle. And in the industry, the general way they handle that is, okay, this is getting boring. We're going to just turn the music down or turn it off for a little while. Because there's only so much you can do with current sort of contemporary technology and my techniques. PCG is critiqued though for a lack of polish and you know generating 10,000 volts or oatmeal. So we hear from Jeremy in all of our modules first years, you've got that coming. Um, it's for game dev two, but it does generally, if we look at the UTMA, it raises performance expectancy for a low effort expectancy because you can go on YouTube and find a thousand tutorials on different PCG techniques. And it has a positive social influence because people just use it so widely, but it has been accepted. Uh, again, by comparison, procedural music hasn't, and we will get to why the AI pianist sort of came into fruition shortly. But there have been a few good applications like No Man's Sky and Rise of the Tomb Raider, Marvel's Avengers, but they all utilize like methodologies or approaches where the composer isn't actually expected to change how they work, which is, you know, it lowers that effort expectancy which is really kind of the only way you can go forward on a case-by-case -case situation as it is at the moment. So, you know, it's very unclear how this is seen as like acceptable. So I decided I was going to interview 11 composers and they were all from varying levels. There was some AAA, there was some Indian, some mid-core. And it's in press now, but there is a paper coming out in transactions on games in, it should be towards the end of the year, like the next month or two. So 11 interviews turned into 13 hours of recorded data and anyone who has done a thematic analysis is probably flinchy because it was a lot of data. And we used an inductive approach to coding and then a latent approach to analysis. But it turned into 1,200 codes, uh, 250 broader codes, because 1,200 is too many by any measure. This became 30 sub-themes and then five themes. And the themes you can see here, the sub themes, the count in the original codes, and then the thematic umbrella they fall under. The sub themes were that we found were composed of can see benefits to work from flow from AI, which is to be expected really. Um, but the concerns of composers were far more complex and multifaceted than we first anticipated. It wasn't just fear of job replacement; they were had fears of things like ownership and authorship so who owns what's made who's in trouble if it infringes on copyright you know will it sound like my music or will it sound like training data we also had ethical concerns about training data then there were other themes like the lack of understanding and trust generally like across the 11 participants they all had different understandings of what procedural actually means which is not particularly good when you're trying to get them to try out technology. Like a lot of procedural music systems aren't even using AI. They just, well, they're not using ML. And neural nets are just using rules-based systems. And, you know, if you, even the keyword in the title, if you can't get them to sort of have a <clears throat> broad definition that they all agree on, you're going to struggle to try and sell them the idea of using it. But that leads to a lack of understanding, which leads to a lack of trust, which is problematic. There's also a theme of a lack of standardized support within the industry. Oh, God, I've run out of time. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, there's lack of standardized support, and there's also this inherent clash between the creative ego and um, AI as a whole. Because if you said to the composers, what do you think about a melody generator? They got very, very upset and told me that it's not a thing a machine can do. 
if you said how about a bass guitar they were like oh i'm not too bothered about that because their vocational identity is not sort of tied up in the bass guitar it's tied up in the melody and they said what about mixing or mastering or a performance algorithm they're like yeah sell it me now they just didn't really care uh so we'll just skip these sorry but basically in conclusion when we're trying to make music systems or any ai driven technology we should sort of think of how they're going to feel about using it it's better inform future research we should avoid replacing them in the loop and find things that create to do assistive tasks like everyone humanizes their MIDI data if we can outperform the industry standard with expressive rendering algorithm we can speed up their work with them that's more the more open to that it should focus on being open in the design and sourcing training data and just make sure they're concerned with the best um there's the paper if you want to go and find it <laughs> yeah.